On the 23rd of August, 1637, some ministers from the east of Scotland made their way through the streets of Edinburgh. In their hands was a petition to the King's Privy Council. The Council was in emergency session following protests against the new prayer book being forced on the church. The petition was composed by Alexander Henderson, the leader of the Presbyterian movement. It showed that imposing the prayer book was illegal and unbiblical and tended towards Roman Catholicism. When the ministers arrived here at Holyrood House, they were surprised to find another group of ministers from the west of Scotland with a similar petition. Neither knew that the other deputation would be there. But this was no coincidence. The events taking place were being divinely ordered. According to John Livingston, it was this event which was the true beginning of that blessed reformation in Scotland. It marked the beginning of a movement that was going to take the church in Scotland to a more extensive reformation according to God's word. This would be Scotland's second reformation, but sadly it has become Scotland's forgotten reformation. The answer has to do with worship. Many people think it doesn't matter what we do in God's worship as long as God hasn't forbidden it in his word. But God has given clear commandments in the Bible governing all that we do when we worship him. He also says that we are not to add to these things, to these commandments, or to take away from them. And in worship, as in everything else, the issue is not what pleases us, but what pleases God. He is only pleased with the worship he commands. Whatever he has not commanded is forbidden. And that was the problem with the prayer book. It imposed ways of worshiping that God had not commanded. The real test of our willingness to obey God comes when we face opposition. We are often tempted to conform to the norm and it is difficult to stand out as different. What should we do when others want us to adopt or tolerate ways of worship that God has not commanded? Do we just accept this in order to keep the peace? Yet disobeying God's commands never promotes true peace. It can never be right to be more concerned with offending other people rather than obeying God. Let's take a closer look at how the church in Scotland faced this test down through the years. Scotland's Reformation was the most thoroughgoing in the whole of Europe, revolutionising church and state. Some believe that the first General Assembly of the Church of Scotland took place here in the Magdalen Chapel in Edinburgh. With this Reformation, every area of church life, its teaching, discipline and worship, was to be regulated by God's Word, as Christ instructed the Apostles, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. But the Stuart monarchs were not in favour of a church that was ruled by God's Word. They believed that their kingly authority should extend into the church, including its worship. One of them, James VI of Scotland, tried to assert his authority over the church in different ways, mainly by the reintroduction of bishops into the church who would do his bidding. During many conflicts, he sent faithful ministers who opposed this policy into exile, but ultimately, James was successful. In 1618, James used his bishops to force through the drastic changes in worship. Five articles, agreed by a General Assembly in Perth, allowed private baptism and communion. They also required the Lord's Supper to be received while kneeling rather than sitting. The Church of Scotland, since the Reformation, had always observed communion sitting around a table according to the biblical pattern. So they saw kneeling to receive the Lord's Supper as idolatrous because it implied the Roman Catholic view that the bread and wine were to be worshipped as divine. Another of the five articles imposed the, the Holy Days outlawed at the Reformation. Now, the, Refor the Reformed Church of Scotland had only kept the Lord's, day as, the Lord's Day as a holy day for the simple reason that it was the only holy day commanded in the Bible. And the other article required confirmation by a bishop. The church was in turmoil. Many conformed, but others were prepared to suffer rather than accept the changes. One of those who gave very full reasons against accepting the changes was George Gillespie. Gillespie was young and exceptionally gifted. He explained the reasons in a forthright book. He said that these ceremonies in worship had their origin in Roman Catholic worship, not scripture. He argued that they were not necessary, useful or lawful. 
nor was their imposition merely unimportant. The king and bishops responded with repression towards those leading the opposition. They were silenced and exiled. But the ruling powers were also clever enough, however, to turn a blind eye to a great deal of popular resistance. Well, the oppression increased when Charles I took the throne in 1625. Persecution against any dissent was swift and ruthless. Charles was determined to make the Scottish Church conform to the English Church. So he appointed Archbishop Laud to drive forward the movement towards Roman Catholic practice with the result that a new prayer book was imposed on the Scottish Church, which was even more Romeward leaning than anything that England there had yet seen. So all ministers were required to read the prayer book and everyone had to attend church to hear it. The biblical principles of the Reformation were being unraveled. This included its teaching about salvation as well as how the church was organized and how she was to worship God. Events were moving at a rapid pace. Here at St Giles in July 1637, protests turned to riot as the Dean attempted to read the new liturgy. Famously, a woman named Jenny Geddes threw her stool at him in protest. During the months that followed congregations and ministers across Scotland petitioned the government. Under the leadership of Alexander Henderson, the nobles and leading men of the church rose up to renew the National Covenant in 1638. It was first signed here at the Greyfriars Church in Edinburgh. After this, it went to every part of the country where it was sworn to and signed by a vast number of people from every level of society. So today, much confusion in churches arises from people asking the wrong question. They are asking what is acceptable and attractive to themselves rather than what will please God. So we need the courage of these reformers to defend the principle that worship is determined by God's command, not our preference. So the principle is that God forbids what he does not command in his worship. So if we abandon this principle, there's no real control left except human preference and taste. And this can lead to the errors of Roman Catholic worship on the one hand, or a charismatic free-for-all on the other hand. So Scotland has largely departed from the convictions of the Covenanters in this area, and most churches have abandoned these principles. Is your church asking the right question about worship? The Covenanters faced this question with conviction and refused to worship in ways that God had not commanded. It took a great deal of courage to stand up to a monarch claiming absolute power. It's one thing to admire the Covenanters for their courage. It's something altogether different to follow their example. We need to act on these biblical convictions and apply them to the widespread falling away from reformed worship which we see in our own day. If you've been interested in the issues raised in this film, you might like to buy and read a copy of this booklet called Reformed Worship. You can get it from www.reformationscotland.org.